going off on me. So thank you so much for uh, coming out. I think it's pretty awesome to see sort of these fledgling communities of startup founders and others coming together. Uh, and I think this is exactly how Silicon Valley gets started, or people that have experience and they start a company and then they go on to their next thing and help a bunch of other founders. And that cycle just is exactly how, you know, all these great hubs have started. And so I think Berlin is like well on its way and it's really exciting to, to see that grow. Um, so just a bit of overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give a, my, my personal background uh, and then talk a bit about a high level growth product process, but that's more high level ideas. And so trying to anchor it down into some really some so operational focus things. Uh, and then a uh, note about definite optimism. Also, I'm going to talk about some things like, hey, this is a other talk you should check out. And so uh, when I do that, you have to, there's not going to be like a link. So you could just email me, Ivan at yesgraph.com, and that'll be great. So you should all dial it in now. If you have other questions, I'm happy to answer them as well. So a bit of history. Uh, I actually have a background in robotics. So I used to work on self-driving cars before they were cool, worked on the DARPA Grand Challenge. And so that is, a, is interesting in terms of how machine learning has changed over the years. Uh, and it's given me, a, given me a strong technical founding. Um, but really, the problem with robotics is that I figured there weren't going to be any new products for like five to 10 years. And that was like 2007. So self-driving cars come right about there. Uh, and so I started my first company. It's called TipJoy. And we got into Y Combinator in winter 08. And an interesting thing about that is that I remember when I didn't know anything. Like, I didn't know anything about how to raise money, about how to start a company, and so I can really easily commiserate with people that don't know things because they're going to learn. And the good news is, like, this is all very learnable, uh, so there's nothing really that magical or super hard to, to it. Um, and so basically, in my first startup, TipJoy, the idea was to support things you love with social micropayments, and we really had trouble getting off the ground. Uh, and then I went to go work at Facebook on their credit system, and the cool thing about Facebook is that they're so shockingly successful. I remember at the time I joined, they had maybe, I want to say, uh, over 100 million users, and they were talking about, oh, on the, on the road to a few hundred million, and maybe one day we'll be a billion. And so it was really interesting to see the patterns that worked out well for Facebook that they applied to other parts of the product. And so when I was working on the credits team, that's where I, I, the pattern matching really kicked in. It's like, well, you have a new product you're trying to kick off within Facebook, and you could use the same tactics and methods that you apply to your normal product here uh, to the credits team. And the same tactics can also be applied to the, to the ads product. If you think about Facebook, sure, they have the social network, the consumer product, but then they have this whole B2B business product around the ad sales that they do. And the same teams work on these same kinds of tactics. And so this is where I started to see some patterns develop. And then when I went to go work at Dropbox, this was such a compelling idea because I had this chip on my shoulder about my first startup not doing well that I thought, okay, this is what I really want to focus on. So I dove really deep in on that experience at Dropbox. Um, and I've been doing my second startup now for a few years. And what we do at YesGraph is we help products grow by helping their users recommend who they should invite. So for example, if you have, like Gusto is a payroll product in uh, the United States, and we help them build a referral program by recommending the decision makers that should be using Gusto. So we make their referral program better. So part of the, my role there is also talking to a bunch, this is in our sales process, talking to a bunch of companies about their growth. So from Dropbox and some advising that I do and investing and talking through YesGraph sales process, I end up talking to hundreds of companies about how to drive growth. And so here's some of the ideas about, about growth that I have there. This is going to be a high level and hopefully starts to sound really repetitive because I really want to drive this home. Basically, you need to work really hard to find a single goal you're trying to improve and then find out what levers move that needle, how you can move, uh, what you can change in your product to help achieve that goal. And when you do that, when you have this map that you build out, uh, you're going to come up with a bunch of ideas. And you always have more to do than you have resources to do. So you need to triage. And you want to triage by cost, benefit, and risk. And then you want to run these as experiments. Uh, to, so the things you decide to work on, you want to have a hypothesis and look at the data and uh, then have a very high pace of experimentation. This all sounds pretty simple when you explain it like this. I'm going to dive into a lot of detail. Uh, but trust me, it's a bit harder in practice. Uh, but hopefully, this is kind of like a simple overview. So first off, picking a goal. Uh, so there's some really good examples of wonderful goals to set. So I mean, JFK saying, we're going to go to the moon. And that united like 
very many people to come to work together on this project and they achieved it. And I think a really key uh, detail about the Apollo project, you know what the average age was on the Apollo project? 25. Most people don't know that. Incredibly young. And so this incredibly ambitious project united hundreds of thousands of people to work together and they made it. And the definitive like, singularity of that goal helped them achieve that. Another really good, more recent example is this guy. Elon Musk, one of my heroes, he's amazing. He's like, climate change, we're fucked. We need to get off this planet and we need to solve like, electric cars and solar and rocketry. Uh, and the, the clarity of the goal helps unite everyone behind it. And there's a bunch of other examples. Like Facebook, the goal for a very long time was to get everyone in the world on Facebook. Uh, and there are other examples that kind of go the opposite direction. Like, I used to give Foursquare as an example. Like, what's the purpose of Foursquare? Are they selling data? Are they have a social network? Now they're definitively like, we know what we're doing. We're selling data, and so we understand what's going on there. Another good example is Twitter. Is the purpose of Twitter to publish a tweet? Is it to read? Do I even need to sign in? Is it like YouTube? Or is it like an ad business? What's their goal? And as a result, everything is so muddled and confusing. And that lack of unity on the vision is just so incredibly important. And it sounds like a, a small step, but it's actually really, really important to have that definitive focus. So after you, uh, after you have a goal, you want to find out how you can influence that. And that has to do with breaking down your product and your metrics and your analytics there. So this is an example I love. Uh, this is a map of what people thought the world used to look like. And so you know, a few years before this map was made, the Americas didn't even exist. So if you thought if you went west, you're not really sure what's going to happen. And this is a bit better idea, better to know that the Americas are there. But it's actually really wrong. Everyone knows this is not what the world looks like, right? This is what the world looks like. This is a cartogram of the world where size is adjusted by population. This is actually a much more accurate representation of the world than most of the maps you look at, especially, of course, the Mercator projection. So if you want to think about what matters in the world, and also my favorite part is that tiny sliver, yellow sliver of Russia, very tiny. Uh, it's very small and sad. Uh, so uh, the other countries kind of balance it out. Uh, this is actually another and often better representation. This is the world uh, normalized by GDP, where Europe looks a lot bigger. And Africa is sadly very small, and uh, Japan is enormous for their size. And so the point is, like, the territory, you need to understand it. And I'll talk a bit more about an example of this to dive deep. Uh, but, you know, the first map is, is pretty good. Second map, depending on your context, might be better. But you need to have this understanding on how to influence your product. And I'll give some concrete examples later. So what happens when you break down your product like this is that uh, to understand how to influence your goal is that you'll have a bunch of things you want to get done. And this is actually the core of how you go about running your product process. You need to figure out which are the things you want to get done and how. And you basically need to triage them by cost, benefit, and risk. And cost is all about you know, how many resources it might take, like design or engineering, how many dollars it might cost if it's like a marketing channel. Benefit is if it works, how, how well will it work? And risk is the likelihood that it works. So if you send an email to a user to say, hey, go send a referral, and it has a certain conversion rate, if you send another of those emails, that's a very low risk proposition. Uh, so there's, uh, there's all these, uh, I'll give an example of this later, but uh, the triage is like a really important part here. And then when you want to run experiments, you have to have a hypothesis and prove it or disprove it with data. And it, it sounds really simple. It's like a fifth grade science experiment, but it's actually really, really important to actually start running things like that. And you don't run it by gut. Uh, and so uh, that's the really important process towards the end. All right, so let's dive into a bit more detail. Those are kind of the high level ideas, and let's talk a bit more about exactly how this works. So uh, this is Emmett Shear. He's one of the co-founders of Justin TV and Twitch. He's an amazing guy. And this is a video of a talk he gave to, to startup school, uh, to how to start a startup. It's a YC-affiliated thing. Uh, and it's an amazing talk because it's basically how to interview customers. And I think what's interesting about this is, let's say at the very beginning of a new startup, uh, you're building a new product. And the core, when you have a new product, is product market fit. And let's say you're building a product for yourself. So you really know what to build. Uh, but then the issue on the product market fit is like, what's the market? How do you reach your customers? And so you should go out and try to interview customers to understand them a bit better. Uh, and so that is really important. But if you're not building a product for yourself, then you really, really definitely need to understand your customers. So you should go out and interview them. So this, this is what you should do either way. Either, uh, no matter who you're building your product for, you need to go out and interview these people uh, and try to talk to them to understand what's going on. So you should try to find this talk online. So uh, this is another example as far as like goal setting. Um, so 
your goal for most companies should be revenue or retention. Um, and so I want you to understand this graph. It's actually pretty simple. You take user age on the x-axis there, and the y-axis is the percentage of users that are still around. And at the very start, on the top left, it's going to be 100%. Then it's going to be a nosedive down on like going way down there. And a bad product is going to cross the x-axis. So what that means is eventually all your users are gone. And if this is your graph, first off, if you're not looking at this graph, start looking at it. It's very important. Second off, I can pretty much guarantee for early products, they're all shit like this. They just goes in craters, and it's, it's really terrible. And I think a big misconception about growth well, the, one of the biggest ones is that there's some silver bullet that will solve all my problems. That's just not true. Uh, just so you have to think much more about the process around it. Uh, but then also for uh, a big misconception is that acquisition is everything. You need to get your customers. You need to get them in the front door. And if your metrics look like this, it does not matter how many users come in the front door. Everyone is going to be gone and you're going to die. So don't, don't do that. <laughs> so you need to work on it. So what you have to do is talk to customers in that first step and the second step to figure out what went wrong. And hopefully, you can start to have a graph that starts looking like this, where like it ekes up a little bit up and to the right. Uh, and so this graph, if it's a long-term retention, even if it's like 5% or 1%, that's still better. Uh, and so your core goal very often should be retention. And you should be looking at these cohort data uh, to get that done. It's incredibly important. So, uh, there's another talk by Alex Schultz, who ran growth at Facebook, that talks about this in more depth, and Brian Balfour as well. Um, and so he's, uh, he's, he's great. This is like what unifies Facebook in, in figuring out how they're going to drive growth. So let's give an example of what I mentioned before. Like you have a goal, let's say it's retention, um, and you want to you figure out like exactly what that map is and how it works. So uh, let's give an example of a mobile app. All right, so you have an app, and it's uh, a user comes in from the app store, and maybe they have a search, and then they install the app, uh, and then they register after they open it, uh, and maybe there's some kind of notification that brings them back the second day. So that graph is now populated. You now have a user that tried the app and came back the next day, so you have data in there. Um, so this is like step one, right? Like you have a basic understanding of how your app works. You can get more people to come into the app store, you can get a better conversion rate on the registration page, better notification on the push, and then your numbers will go up. Of course, there's so much more detail than that. In terms of the App Store, it's like, well, what search terms are people using? And how, which categories are you ranking for? Maybe for lifestyle, productivity. Uh, maybe you've been featured, and that could be something like, it's like a burst that comes in and comes down. So you want to know how that exactly measures. Also, you have um, rankings by a different country. Um, and uh, also, paid acquisition has a huge number of stats within that, just to get people into the front door to install the app. And then when you do install, like when you're on like the landing page, it's like what is when you're on the app search result page, you have the screenshots and the reviews and the stats and the metrics around that to even get that person to click install. So the more reviews you have, the higher stars, the better it can be. All these things can be tested. Like, and even things like if you have an app that's supposed to be in areas that data is very expensive, like the data size of the app matters a great deal. If it's 10 megabytes versus 25 versus 60 versus 600, it's an enormous difference. So all these different variables you can have just to get to the user to install the app. Then on the registration page, you have an onboarding experience and the copy text on saying, hey, uh, what is this app all about? Maybe you can have a demo before you register. You have all the education around the user. Uh, you have different permissions. Like if it's a Photos app, you have to get them to approve that. So how do you prime them to, to approve it? They have different forms that are required, maybe their email, maybe their phone number. And the point is, this is like exhaustive, right? Like every single thing I'm talking about could be the source of an experiment that you're trying to run. You're not even done. And then on notification, you have different channels for email or for push. Uh, and then is it going to be like triggered by another user, transactional, or some kind of life cycle thing that they get a, a day or hour later? Uh, and then what is the call to action? What are you asking them to do? And everything here has copy text. So it should be really obvious that I, like, just this list that I came up from the top of my head is like categorically, like what, 30 or 40 things that you can try to work on? And so you're going to have way too much to work on, way too much, which is great news. So you have a bunch of ideas. And this, this should be the easy part figuring out all the things you could be doing. And, oh yeah, I forgot, for, for re-engagement, there's a whole other category here, sorry. Like, even in how you measure things, so you're talking about activity, but what does that even mean? Like, what, how do you even measure activity? You say that somebody's around. Uh, one thing I've seen is people bucket, like, by the number of days in the last seven where you're active, so one and two would be, like, sparsely active, but six or seven would be very active. So what activities are they even doing in the app that leads to that level of activity? 
um, and like trying to under understand how one user might trigger another one. So anyway, this, this is what I'm talking about when I say build a map. Like, this is all incredibly confusing, and so you have all these things you could be doing, and in many cases, you're not even paying attention to this part, uh, to different areas you should be working on. Um, and let alone things outside of your product that you could be doing. Like you could be throwing a conference, or you could be like having an affiliate program. All these things you could be doing even outside of your current experience. And all of these should be on the table of things you should work on to try to drive growth. Here's another example of building a map. This is something near and dear to my heart about a viral flow. So what is a viral flow? Uh, you have a user that takes an action and they bring in another user. That's like very basic, right? But let's go a little bit deeper. You can say that some percentage of your users take an action, then they spread out some link, and then some others receiving that link or some message are going to be converted to new users. So to, con to make this really concrete, I'm on Instagram, I post a photo, and I syndicate that out to Facebook. Somebody clicks on that link and sign up for in signs up for Instagram. That's how Instagram grew initially. Another example, Dropbox, the shared folder invitation. I want to collaborate with someone, I type in their email, they're not a Dropbox user, they get an email in their inbox, and they convert to becoming a Dropbox user, right? And this, those are really different. One is an email shared folder business kind of productivity collaborative flow. The other is, a, you know, super frivolous photo sharing. And photos are awesome, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it's like not in a professional context. Uh, and it's just sharing a photo. But both of them have this behavior where a user takes an action, and then there's some kind of spread, and there's a conversion rate on them. And so each of these, so you have what the actions that you're looking at, how many users syndicate photos on Instagram? How many users on Dropbox use shared folder invitations? That's the participation rate. And then what actions do they take? How often, how many links are being sent out? That's like the spread rate. Uh, and so if you then look at the conversion of each of these, you can get the best thing about these metrics is that this, this is a product where you could break it down for each one and then you get a viral coefficient, which is the new users that were brought in by the old users. And so and each of these steps has, a, like I could break it down again, like 20 different things about them, like all the call to action, all these different messages you want to send, uh, all the landing page experiences. And so th the point is, the point should be really obvious by now, that like there's a million things you can work on if you just have a reasonable map of how your product works. Uh, and then the problem becomes triage. So this is actually a sample of my company's triage. This is from like two years ago, I think. Uh, I don't want to actually show you what was on our roadmap. Uh, so just to give you a sense of it, there's a long list of things and their different categories. And actually, uh, I went through this process for a friend of mine, uh, his company, Vet Pronto, uh, and this is what that actually looks like. So here's a spreadsheet. So just to say what this actually looks like at real startups, you have a list of things you want to work on with a link to a Trello doc to describe what that thing is. I know you can't read this, but you have a category, and then here's the impact and cost and risk and trackability and the sum and all these different things you could track. So now you, you list this out and you say, here are the ones you want to run right now. Uh, and that process, it's really not some, some magical process. You just got to dive in and dig into the data to figure out what experiments you want to run and use your judgment to say, here are the ones you want to do. So this should be also two or three times as long. It could easily be like much longer. So um, when you have an experiment that you want to run, this is like going back to the fifth grade science fair. Here's how it should work. Uh, step one, there should be an overview. I think a lot of people get this wrong. It's kind of like a basic thing. When you have a product spec, make the top few sentences something anyone in the company or even maybe outside the company could read to understand what the fuck this is about. <laughs> like if you just make that work, your docs would be so much easier to understand. So you have an overview. Then you have a hypothesis. Like, well, if we uh, send another email to our users to share a referral link, let's just say, include the link in there, then more referrals will be shared. That's like, that's a hypothesis. The reason we have low participation rate in our referral program is people don't know about a referral program. Let's send them an email about it. That's just like an example. Uh, and then you actually run through the implementation details, and this is just a product spec about what changes you want to make. And then you look at what happened. You run an experiment. Did it work? How much? Look at the data. And what's really, really important, you try to understand why and make some lessons learned. I think very often we run a test, like an Optimizely or some copy test, and we say, oh, it went up by 20%. All right, let's move on. And then you're not done. You actually have no idea what happened. So either way, whether it's good or bad, you have to dig in to understand what happened here. And so this is just like a basic experimental framework. And so if you focus on this process for your testing, um, you should be able to come up with a bunch of lessons learned. Uh, and the thing is, this, this sounds really kind of like basic to drive through. Like it, and it really isn't more complicated than this. Like 
Folks at Facebook are running this process. Folks at Dropbox are running these kinds of experiments. Uh, and they're not doing anything magical. They're just kind of being a bit rigorous with how they organize their data and their projects. So uh, this guy, Brian Balfour, and you could testify, uh, awesome guy. He just watches uh, talks online. Uh, and he's really good about this experimental process and docs. So if you want to find out more from him, he has a site, CoElevate and Reforge. Just check it out. So uh, one other kind of operational thing about this is that it turns out that the number of experiments you run is more important than which experiments you run. That's kind of surprising, right? You would think that you, know, you have to really work on the ones that are super important, and you'll figure that out. But the problem is you don't know what's going to be impactful. So people often in you know, product and design and engineering that have a lot of hubris, they think they know what's best. But data ruins all these expectations. And so you, you need to actually figure out what works by running the experiment and you see what's there. So it turns out some of the most performant growth teams focus merely on their testing velocity. So you run this process and your goal is not to say, move this metric up by this percentage. Your goal is to say, I want to run three experiments every week, or five, or 10, depending on the size of your team. And it's actually a really good kind of simple rubric. So you could say, how many, well, what experiment number are we on? Like, what, what, what are we doing? Uh, how do we get it done? And when I say experiments, I do mean actual experiments. Just want to stress. It's not work on three changes in this week. You have to actually have some rigor with how you go about doing it. So another issue on ops is how you organize your growth team. And so this is, let me kind of explain this picture. On the left, you have a few projects. You have a few project teams. And one of them is a growth team. And they're full stack. So you have a designer and an engineer and a product manager and all these people, and they're the ones running growth. On the right, this example here, you have a growth manager embedded on a bunch of different teams. So which one's better? By a show of hands, who thinks the one on the left is better? OK, that's saw one hand. Who thinks the one on the right is better? Oh, a bunch of people. Uh, you know what I think? I think I have no idea. It's not obvious which one is better. It totally depends on your company and how it works and how it's run. And there's a bunch of issues either way. Uh, and this is something you want to dive deep into. So for example, if you have a dedicated growth team, uh, do they have the resources to do full stack development? Let's say you have a mobile app or some complex data backend. Is there, there's like a bunch of things you want to get done there. Do they know how to do it? Like literally, do you know how to program on Android to make the change, the test, to run on Android? Because if you have a dedicated growth team, you better have that full stack knowledge. Uh, and then uh, also, if you have the dedicated growth team, how do the other folks organize their metrics? What are they doing? What are they working on? You know, like, what's their goal? Is it not growth? What the fuck is it? <laughs> like, is it, who in the company is working on what that isn't there? And sometimes you get isolated teams, like DevOps has a clear isolation to make everything work well, so I get that. But there's a bunch of problems there. And then on the right, you have these embedded growth folks, which sounds great, because you could have a guy, like a, somebody dedicated on a project just for driving growth. But then how do you resolve conflict? You have a product manager on the team and a growth person on the team. They say something different. Who decides what? How do these people share insights? How do the people that are working on this growth team work together? And this is the same issue, for example, for a design team. How do you make it so that every designer on a team is not working in isolation without actually sharing some common theme? So it's really not obvious which one is better. And the point is, you're going to make a decision here either way. And as you grow, this becomes a much, much bigger problem. Um, so by the way, uh, Uber is organized like on the left. Uh, just for, for those of you who know. Uh, so you have a bunch of projects that have a specific goal, and they're full stack, uh, and that's the way they get things done. Um, but uh, Facebook's also closer to that. Dropbox, I would say, is more to the right, where you have individual product managers focused on different things. By the way, there's a really good talk by this guy, Jared. He used to work at Square, uh, and also on, uh, he's, a, he's a VC now. Um, so if you, if you check him out, Jared Fleischer. Um, then he gave a good talk on specifically this topic. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of my overview of uh, the growth stuff, and I'm happy to take questions about this. Um, I think there's a lot more detail that we can get into. I wanted to end on a slightly different note, um, though this guy, Peter Thiel, you know, fuck him for supporting Trump, but actually he has some really, really exciting ideas. And one of the core ideas is to become a definite optimist. Uh, and so if you look at this matrix, it's a little fun. And this is going to be some really, really broad generalizations. Uh, so you have the idea of uh, understanding that the world is definite or indefinite. Like definite is like, I know exactly what I need to do, or I'm going to execute on this. And indefinite is like, we don't really know. They have optimism or pessimism. So the 50s and 60s in the US, you know, when we went to the moon, that was like definite optimism. Like we could do this, here's how we do it, we get it done, fuck yeah. And today, US is still optimistic, but it's like really more uh, indefinite on exactly how we're going to get better. 
And then, uh, so according to Teal, uh, China is certain that the current run will end. And so there's some uh, definite pessimism while you have strong growth. And you look at slowing growth and people are like really concerned about that. And Europe actually don't want to generalize this much because it seems like you get a lot of definite optimists in Berlin and other cities are not like, quite like that. And so this is a really exciting idea because uh, some cities are <laughs> differentiating but in Europe, the, the cliche is like, well, things are bad, but we could drink and be merry. That's like the cliche that other, uh, from outsiders. I don't think that's fair, but that's what Peter Thiel says, so I'm gonna blame him. Um, and the, the message I wanna send is that like, you wanna be in the top left. It's a really big deal, because it, it's exactly what we're trying to do at startups to make the world a better place. It's like, we think the world can be better. Here's exactly how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna be the one to do it, and then we'll get it done. So here's a good example. This guy over, I think, in the spring of last year made a projection. This is complicated. I'm not going to explain it. Basically, the price of solar going down. And this projection, see that line there, is for like 2030. At that point, the cost of per kilowatt hour solar would be three cents. That's, that's like the projection. And actually, it happened like a month later. So this is, uh, if you look at very large installations of solar panels, the cost per kilowatt hour, but this is sunny areas, whenever I see all the solar panels, panels in Germany, I'm like really confused, it's like not sunny. Um, but like, so in the really sunny areas of the world, there's a huge amount of solar. And if you look at just like the cost of the installations, they're getting super cheap. And the really important point about this, this is like cheaper than natural gas. So this is where like I can get some definite optimism. Because if you look at solar, we're gonna actually make it so that solar is the cheapest form of new energy. We don't need to have some unified world of climate change agreements. The market will solve this problem, hopefully, if technology gets better, and then climate change will be averted. We will get to Mars within my lifetime, and hopefully my kids will walk on there safely as easily as I could cross the Atlantic. Uh, I think machine learning is actually gonna be a really big deal. I think we're gonna enhance our biology in wonderful ways, the most obvious of which is like, find out what causes a lot of diseases and hopefully solve them. And also, like, have uh, a huge boost in productivity with machine learning. Um, I think uh, online courseware is going to dramatically make education far, far cheaper and change the way we work. And so the way we avert a crisis of automation is by making it far, far easier to get new skills. Um, I think a connected world of billions of people getting cell phones is going to make it so that it's going to be a lot harder to be incredibly poor. We're going to solve extreme poverty with our connectivity tools. I also think that, I mentioned this earlier, like how do you make a new Silicon Valley? How do you make a new area that starts to build the future? Well, you have people that have done it, and then you do it again, and you do it again. So, for example, this is uh, my family's creation. So part of this trip, I visited Zagreb, and I got to see this guy. Uh, I got to see his company, at least, Rimats. And so this is a BMW. You know, started out as a pretty good car already, and then he gutted it, DIY, and started making an electric car that started winning all these road races, drag races. So this is a guy that just, as a hobby, decided, I'm going to go and start to build these electric cars and now has the fastest electric cars in the world. And this is in Croatia, and like, uh, I don't know how much you know, but it's like not uh, a lot of startup infrastructure. So you don't have a lot of investors, people are very risk averse, people don't understand stock, like the ownership stuff is, is weird, you know, like you don't have as many examples of growing startups. And so now I have a really reasonable company that builds these supercars, and they're like a half million dollars, million dollars, like crazy. I'm not in the market yet for them. And also they have a business of selling components. So to companies like Daimler and BMW to make electric drivetrains and, and battery packs. And I think the awesome thing about this is that anyone, even in an environment that's not really conducive to a lot of startups, can go and build an amazing company like this if you just go out and do it. And so that's my, my bit about definite optimism. I think everyone should go and do it. Anyway, that's, that's it. That's all I got. Yo. Time for questions or? Think, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions, right? 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 Ah, nothing. Uh, yeah, first one there. I was about to ask one. I had one in reserve. Hi. Um, first off, uh, great presentation. was very vibrant. Uh, I definitely felt your, your vibes. <laughs> and um, in regards to, to the um, overwhelm that you uh, kind of presented uh, when you talked about the uh, gross practices you could do, um, what, is, what is your uh, workflow of prioritization? Uh, so you have the desk full of stuff you can work throughout your funnel, and then uh, where do you say, okay, this is the 80-20 we have to work on? 
I think 80-20 or Pareto is great. Like, what are the easiest things that we can do? And especially if you're focusing on pace of experimentation, the easiest things are like the easiest things to say yes to. So for example, copy text changes, like this button has a call to action. You could test a different call to action. Those are far and away. You should just be constantly running those tests, and those are really easy. Uh, but one thing interesting, let me go back to this. Uh, you can actually kind of see it a little bit. Uh, so this is the, the triage list. So the right here says founder hours and others. And so here's, here's the bit, the sum. So my friend here, Joe, that was working on this with me, he's like, I need a way to combine all these things into a single number in order to make it so I could decide what to do. Um, and he wanted to do that, and that was fine. I think that's actually a mistake. I think what you need to do is use your judgment. Uh, and I know that's not definitive, but uh, I think you need to trust your experience that you go on there. And so if you have a reason to justify this being better, like this is a super easy experiment. I mentioned copy text changes. Those are always super easy to make. Then you could use that. But I think sometimes you just have to use your intuition for whether it's a good idea or not. Um, and you constantly need to hone this judgment. This is one reason why looking at the results of an experiment is so important, because that builds up your collective intuition as a team as to what's good and what's bad. And it's a little bit subtle, because if you start to run a lot of experiments, you'll start to build up this kind of experience. Um, but a lot of things are really different, you know? There's a lot of different things that you could be doing, and so there's no, unfortunately, there's not like a quantitative solution here. Um, and I think that uh, judgment is underrated, so I think that's the main thing, as how you, how you determine what to do. So kind of like the just do it uh, mentality? I mean, you do it informed by the data. And so, for example, I think that the level of detail required for each of these rows should be enough to have a basic understanding of the engineering cost. So if I say something like, um, I don't know what's a good example, let's build a mobile app. That is not nearly refined enough to know exactly what's going on there. It's like depends on what, how clean your APIs are, the challenges of who's on your team, uh, and exactly how much you're going to build up functionality within the app versus elsewhere. And so you need to have these units of tasks be broken down so that you actually understand them. And so I think uh, what I'm saying is use your judgment after you've done the basics of like you, you have enough of understanding to know what goes on in that. Hi, um, great presentation. Um, my question is the viral, the viral coefficient formula that you showed. Um, I know that the viral coefficient must be higher than one so that if you invite one user, it must be False. that the other one user has to invite one more uh, or at least two. Um, so how did you come up with the um, other variables there? I mean, um, is, it, is, it, is it true for every consumer tech company that it has to be like that, or are there other differences? I mean, some of this stuff is hard to track. So for example, Snapchat has this in-person virality with their QR codes, which I presume are used very often. Um, but they can't track that really, really well, all the steps involved in this. Because I mean, that literally requires two people standing in person. How often does that happen? You know? So you, you know the conversion. You know when a, a QR code is scanned, but you don't actually know the higher steps in the funnel to do that. And so another good example of this is word of mouth. And so word of mouth is debatably viral growth, but you don't actually measure a lot of these points. I think your question is kind of interesting, though, that, that you, you hit on two different parts. One of them is around viral coefficient being more than one. Um, there's a lot of bullshit around growth, and that's one of them. Uh, and just to say that's just not true. Uh, so the idea that a viral coefficient is more than one is that what that means is they have a certain user base. Let's say you have 100 users. And more than one would mean they bring in more than 100 users, right? Like they bring in 101. That would be a ratio of users, new users to all users of more than one, right? And so the math on this gets really bad really fast if you know anything about exponential growth. Uh, and so there's no product on the planet that grows that way. Or those that do or have come close to it focus so much on acquisition, that's like the only purpose of the product is to get people to invite others, that they don't focus on retention and they have what's called a shark fin. And so just imagine a graph that looks like a shark fin. It goes super high up and then crashes back down and gets eaten by the sharks. Uh, it's really like terrible. You see this all the time. And so I can't give specific stats for Dropbox. Dropbox had an incredible amount of growth uh, from social channels. And for the per user viral coefficient, it was like never even close to that, uh, never even close to one. Um, and still, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be. You can still grow, a huge percentage of your growth can be from viral, uh, from a social channel, and it doesn't need to be that big. Kind of a second question you had there was, how do you break it down? Um, uh, sort of like, how did, how did I come up with these numbers uh, given like that overview number? Um, and I've seen just a bunch of viral flows, and so I kind of use my judgment on that. 
It is also like a discrete process to understand what's there. And you could have more things involved in it. So for example, even usage, I can say how many people come to a page where they could send a referral, and then the next step would be that they actually take an action. So you could even break it down even further. Uh, or I could break it down the spread. The spread is kind of interesting because you could do it per channel. So you can have like Facebook, that's like a post. It's like a one-to-many versus email, which is sort of a one-to-one -one for each email that you send. So actually, the channels are pretty different. I mentioned, for example, Instagram posting to Facebook. That's actually really different than emailing five people. Uh, so the, the actual stats that you track can match the channel that you use. Um, in terms of how you break it down, I think it's just a matter of using your judgment. <laughs> so it's like you need, to, you need to understand what's going on there. Um, I think it's also related to what I was mentioning earlier about what you're able to track. So if you could see, so one kind of uh, heuristic you could apply is like how easy, like can I understand this data? So an example that came up today in office hours, and I don't know nearly enough about brand advertising, but like, oh, you have a billboard uh, and you want to acquire somebody with that billboard. How exactly do you track that? And that's actually pretty hard. It's offline advertising. It's really hard to do that. And I know some examples of putting billboards in certain regions, like certain cities, and not in others, so you know the effectiveness of a billboard. So you could do like the city A-B test to actually get quantitative metrics out of something that's hard to track. And word of mouth is exactly like this. So what I've seen for word of mouth is also um, survey users and ask them how they signed up. You know? And if they say, a friend told me, it's like, OK, word of mouth. It worked. <laughs> so you, you can start to track things that way. Good luck on the lead.